I'm Fred Smith. I have the Competitive Enterprise Institute, and we're talking to Professor Ronald Coase um, in preparation for a conference we're going to be deal dealing with on the declining marginal cost problem and its implications for public policy. And I am Ronald Coase. I'm a professor emeritus of economics at the University of Chicago, where I still do research and writing at the age of 93. We're, we're going to be asking some questions that deal with largely the marginal cost question, but some of the other prominent papers you've written and their implications for modern policy. Let's talk a bit about the marginal cost controversy first. In, in that paper written almost 50 years ago, as I recall. Yes, it was published in 1946 after the war had finished, but essentially was contained ideas that I developed before the war. Before the war. Uh, when I was in my 20s. 20s. Uh, I developed all my good ideas when I was young. Well, I'm glad you kept writing about them as you got elderly then. The, um, the question, the marginal cost question was essentially industries that had, that had declining costs, that the cost of the last output unit was considerably less than the earlier ones, um, led to problems in, in traditional economics because if one were to charge that low price, then one would not recover enough to cover the overall cost of producing the item. And this led to a problem. And why don't you explain how it was traditionally resolved and how you suggested it be resolved? Well, the, the situation is one in which average costs are declining. If average costs are declining, the costs of additional units of output are less than the average costs of the total output. Now, economists saw that you ought to, to allow people to buy things at the cost. What is the cost? The cost of the additional units. That is, that's the cost. And so they suggested that all prices should be equal to the cost of additional units. That is marginal cost. The difficulty was, of course, that marginal cost was less than average cost. So if you did this, you couldn't cover total cost. Well, that's no problem, said the, the, the economists. If you are in this sort of situation, the government will pay the difference. And so they suggested that uh, you should allow firms to charge a price equal to marginal costs, and the difference between the average costs and price, or total costs and receipts, should be borne by the, the government. And in this way, everyone would be happy, prices would equal costs, and uh, we get supplies at the lowest cost possible. And you had, you raised questions about the wisdom of that solution. The, the, the wisdom comes about, it's, it's hardly wisdom, it's so simple. If you, if the government is going to pay for this difference between uh, total costs with, with marginal cost uh, and, and uh, the uh, receipts w when prices equal marginal costs, how is the government going to get the money? It's going to get the money by taxation. But if it's taxes, it's going to raise price above marginal costs somewhere else. So you really aren't getting rid of the problem at all. You're just creating the problem somewhere else. For some reason or other, economists didn't see this. Uh, my argument was very simple. All my arguments are simple. And it's very hard to get them accepted. Yes. The, um, the, uh, the, and, but then you suggested that there were alternatives to either going bankrupt or government subsidies. Well, the alternatives were known to everyone who pays an electricity bill. It's known as the two-part tariff, or you can have multi-part tariffs, where you pay an amount which is not related to your total consumption, plus a charge which is related to your consumption. Yeah, yeah. 
Economists don't study what goes on in the real world. They live in an imaginary world. And in an imaginary world, uh, there weren't multi-part tariffs, and all things could be done, uh, as I've said, on the blackboard. Yes. Well, they have a series now, of course, of creative multi-part pricings in telecommunications, electricity, and elsewhere, but very little economic insights into them because, as you say, economists rarely study these rate structures. Well, they don't need to, <laughs> because they have their own imaginary system which they study. <laughs> which doesn't need all this complexity. It doesn't need it. <laughs> Facts are no, not necessary. To, to what extent do you feel that because the economist, in a sense the priest of the market, don't deal with this reality, this necessary reality of multi-part pricing, there is, among many political commentators on pricing, a feeling that there's something unjust about this system that it is discriminatory, that discriminatory pricing is one of the ones you're charging different people different amounts for the same good and service. There, the feeling of somehow this is unfair and that therefore the pricing that the market demands not being legitimized by the economist and being misunderstood by populists and by politicians, somehow we're in trouble that we have to rethink. Yes, well people don't understand that with this discrimination total receipts are higher and therefore things can be pr produced which otherwise wouldn't be produced and the people who pay the low prices are better off, the people who buy uh, at the high prices are better off. So uh, the fact that people are better off with this system isn't as important as the fact that some people get more gain than others. Well, the interesting thing is, as you point out, is if one goes from a one price model to a, a varied price model where different people are put in different categories and charge different amounts, some people will be paying higher prices, but that spread also means that some people who would be locked out of the market, maybe in, uh, admitted, paying a much lower price, typically those are lower income people, or often maybe lower income people, so in a sense, price differentiation, or diversity pricing, I guess we might call it, actually democratizes in some of these markets, allows more to participate. Well, it certainly benefits all classes yes. of consumers, and uh, some more than others. If we can't have a system in which everyone gains equally, the idea is that we don't have it. Yeah. Uh, which means you don't have any progress at all because progress always helps some people before it helps others. A system that demands that everyone cross the finish line at the same time will have very slow races. That's right. That's right. <laughs> all right, let's see. Uh, do you have any advice on we might use or in your own work on how to improve public understanding of the legitimacy of price differentiation or price differences? I find it very difficult to answer that question because the, the important things that economics teaches one are often very simple and it's these simple truths that are ignored and have been ignored, you know, for centuries. It's hard. The, the things are simple, true and hard to accept in a way. That's right. Yeah. Uh, error is, is easier to accept yeah. so you get a lot of error. Let's talk about, um, there are industries that, uh, some of the industries that might be characterized by this declining cost situation where marginal costs are less than average costs, could be high fixed cost industries, um, airlines, um, steel mills, um, telephone, uh, telephone, electricity grids, and so on. Um, do they, in your work, you've dealt with some of those industries, uh, certainly telecommunications at one time. The, any implications you see or questions that come out of the, the need for marginal cost pricing or the need for multi-part pricing or, or, or alternative other approaches. Multi-part pricing is one solution. Vertical integration might be another. Um, resale price maintenance might be another. There are an array of things that can, con contractual pre-purchases where you agree to buy a certain amount before the product is even produced. Um, any thoughts in those areas? Or? Yes, sir. there are many ways in which you can handle this, this problem. All of them 
are seen to be pernicious, and therefore all solutions are wrong. Mm. Uh, it, 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 I don't understand why it is that everything that I've said is very simple and people have found it very hard to accept. Mm. With it, we've seen today in the drug controversy, the pharmaceutical controversy, uh, there's actual bills now at, at the state levels to require that every drug, every the purchases of a drug in any state be the lowest of the drug prices of any other state. That in effect all prices should be below average, I guess is what we'd That's say. Right. Uh, this, these are politically very popular, but they seem to be almost the antithesis of understanding that prices at marginal cost are lower are non-sustainable, cannot well, This is part of a general view. If you take National Health Service, right. where health services are provided by the government for nothing, mm -hmm. this is universally applauded. Mm -hmm. The only difficulty is if you go to countries where the system is in operation, many of the services which are provided for nothing are not available. And so, on the one hand, you can say how nice it is that, that people don't have to pay very much. On the other hand, how unpleasant it is that you can't get them. Yeah. Well, this is the general argument. When resources are scarce, the pricing system acts to ration those. If you frustrate the pricing system, some other form of rationing will exist, and the morality of that pricing system often is far more dubious. Uh, who do you know when a healthcare system can become far more important than your willingness to pay? Uh, That's right. Um, one of the areas where the fixed cost issue is coming up a lot now in this modern age is intellectual property, where there are tremendous fights now going on about the copying of, of music off the internet, the uh, copying of, uh, of movies, people going into movie theaters with hype, with very accurate digital cameras, taping it directly off the screen, going out and editing a bit, and having copies of movies within a day after the movie's release in a theater. All of these areas are relying today largely on intellectual property. Um, as a way of protecting them and the government then acting in a very a direct way to um, police, um, uh, police against piracy, to throw people in jail who are doing copying. Some of these people are very young people and so on. Do you have any, any thoughts about whether other ways of receiving revenue from, which after all is another declining cost industry, might be better than sole reliance on intellectual property rules? That's a long question. So, yeah. It's a long question, but uh, it's difficult to give the right long yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, you just have to take it really case by case. Mm -hmm. I don't think you can give a general answer. Why? Because if you ad adopt the view that people should not be allowed to copy, you lose something. Right. If you don't allow them to copy, you also gain something. Mm -hmm. People can get the product who otherwise wouldn't get. You have to, to uh, compare these two things and it'll vary in each case. So it's hard to give a general rule unless you've examined each case. And the, the, the present view is that copying should not be allowed because it denies the copies to people. On the other hand, you are liable to, to, to uh, set up a situation in which there isn't very much to copy. It yeah. It's a very interesting period of history because the, uh, the technology of copying has dropped so precipitously and the ability of items in one part of the world to be transported relatively quickly and inexpensively to another part of the world has made it harder to have geographic price variation. And so, in effect, we find ourselves trying to police a system where the enforcement costs have gone up dramatically and the denied usage costs have gone up dramatically also. Yes, it's, a, it's made a, quite a difference to, to one's attitude. My teacher, Arnold Plant, was, was, who dealt with uh, 
problems of intellectual property, was on the whole opposed to patents and copyright because he said if you introduce something new, you'll have a period in which you can get additional revenue. Well, in his day, that was no doubt true, but nowadays, days, so he was often opposed to patents and so on. But these days, the copying takes place so quickly that people do not have the opportunity of, of getting additional gains during that early period. When, when, when uh, there's very little copying, well, you may have 10 years in which to, sure. to, and that may be enough. The other approaches are dedicated distribution channels where you maintain a very tight control over the flow of the material, sometimes even retaining full control and only leasing out the product with sealed containers and so on. Those offer some hope of, in some cases. Uh, time phasing, where you send out your hardbound book early and then three months later the softbound book comes out. The early readers want to get a copy early so they pay a, a premium for that. Um, there, there appear to be a, cre a, a wide array of, of approaches that are actually used but have received less attention than copy plain copyright because... Oh, they, they ought to be studied and it's quite clear to me at any rate that the results will be very different in different areas. Sure. Some, in some things the copying will be occurs slowly or in forms that you you don't which aren't as good as the original. Mm -hmm. In other cases it'll occur quickly and be identical. Uh, you've got to know the case. Right. And of course, at least that's my view. I mean, and the irony of groups, for example, like ours, to some extent yourself, since we're trying to get our ideas out as more as quickly as possible, to us we see not a piracy, but a leverage distribution of our materials. We we actually would love to see our materials copied more frequently. Well, the, there are, after all, ways in which this can be done. Mm -hmm. Subsidies need not come from the government. Right. There are many. Uh, foundations and others that support research, support the uh, publication of research, and things can happen without the need for patents and so on. I think in fact we're in this interesting change period where the patent system and the intellectual property more broadly are being stressed by being used too extensively and the array of other approaches to compensate or to regain revenue need to be thought of and so we have a, a whole tool chest, tool chest of ideas that can benefit, can allow industries to be viable without necessarily leaning too heavy on any one method to do that. Um, that's a hope. Um, this is on that. Um, much of your uh, writings dealt with this, uh, the question of industrial organization. The wonderful quotes you have about traditional economic or orthodox economic theory did not well explain the firm or indeed the market itself. Uh, I think your terminology was these appear like the, the lumpy raisins in the smooth custard of the market. I don't know whether I said that. What I've said is that economists study the circulation of the blood without a body. <laughs> a very good piece there. And, and of course the challenge therefore is to try to understand what the real institutions are that businessmen evolve to operate in the real world. And you certainly have said that since we don't understand all of those, we tend to misunderstand, how, how did you put it? We misunderstand them and we look for monopolies too often. Oh yes, since, since there are a lot of things we don't understand, there ought to be a lot of regulation. Yes, and we see the antitrust authorities, the antitrust regulatory authorities among others, aggressively expanding their regulatory ambit in the last and indeed in the last five or so years. We've seen it with Microsoft. I don't know whether you followed this one case, but the Federal Trade Commission found a dangerous monopoly emerging in an effort by Nestle to purchase Breyer's ice cream division. The monopoly turned out not to be in ice cream. That was a fairly competitive field. Not in premium ice cream. That turned out to be a fairly competitive field. But in super premium ice cream, 
if one restricted it to that area, there was a dangerous monopoly problem evolving, and the FTC squished it. <laughs> yes, well, if you look far enough and stretch the facts far enough, you can always get an argument for, for regulation. Yeah. And they're good at doing that. Um, in the antitrust area, do you feel that antitrust regulations Overall, antitrust have obviously were intended to improve the market competitiveness of the market. Antitrust regulations now have been around over a hundred years, I guess. Um, in, do you have any feelings about their? If we had it to do over again, should we strengthen them, eliminated them, or done something different? Well, uh, when you say what should we do, the question is whether you can do any of these things right. that you want to do. Uh, what has happened in antitrust? is that the antitrust lawyers are anxious to bring cases and they find cases in almost any circumstance. As I've often put it, if a firm lowers its price, it's predatory pricing. If it keeps the price the same level, it's collusion. And if it raises price, it's monopoly. <laughs> so uh, they they were able. There was uh, I once taught a, a course about antitrust cases, and I was rem reminded of the fact that in one case the argument was that this firm was monopolizing because it was more efficient than the other firms, and therefore had an advantage, and the defense lawyers said, oh no, we're not efficient, we're inefficient. Because you have to counter the other <laughs> argument. Uh, if you read the antitrust cases, it's really laughable. The arguments on both sides are, 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 are silly, but that's the way antitrust goes. The, the, and yet, antitrust remains somewhat respectable even within the law and economics profession. Um, there seems to be a reluctance to, there's a, there's a willingness to criticize antitrust regulation, but a feeling that nonetheless one shouldn't throw it all out, there are redeemable aspects of it. Well, that's, that's right, if, if, if you only did the redeemable aspects, <laughs> uh, there obviously are uh, uh, movements to monopoly. Yeah. Monopolization isn't, isn't something which is impossible. It's possible and it happens. The difficulty is to have an antitrust system which only tackles the ones that ought to be tackled. In fact, what happens is the lawyers try and find uh, monopolization everywhere. Because if you find it everywhere, you employ lawyers everywhere. And they certainly are employing large numbers of lawyers. The, um, uh, the one area where antitrust, I think, is most validated is, of course, in what are called naked price fixing, or as one might be less pejoratively call it, horizontal arrangements to coordinate pricing policies. The idea is, are there cases where, for example, in declining cost industries, where some minimal floor price might be u a useful way of ensuring a certain amount of economic, uh, a certain discouragement of during, during, um, during downturns in, in utilization of a, a material that you still retain a certain amount of earnings. Yes, that's a very interesting that you raise this point because obviously there will be such cases. How do you find them? Mm -hmm. By studying what mm -hmm. firms do. You don't study what firms do. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things to me is that there was a period when the antitrust law, uh, laws didn't apply during the Roosevelt mm -hmm. period, the period of, of NRA, in which the antitrust laws were uh, not applicable. Mm -hmm. And one can study what firms did during that period. Was that done, do you know? Or? It wasn't done. No. That's the interesting thing. Mm. Uh, I, the the uh, archives relating to the various codes are available. Mm -hmm. uh, well, how many people study them? Yeah, we Almost did, no one. Yeah. We did some work when during the uh, when uh, railroads and shipping 
and airlines were being deregulated. There were, under the earlier system, there had been so, were called uh, rate bureaus, which were programs to post rates and coordinate rates that would then be legitimized by the IC Interstate Commerce Commission or the uh, Civil Aeronautics Board and so on. When those were, when the regulatory authorities to underwrite those rates were eliminated, those rate bureaus for a while still remained legal, although they were questioned by the antitrust regulators and they were eventually ruled anti-competitive. It appeared to us, though, that in a world without coercion of those rates, that smaller firms could find a rate bureau a useful way of finding its way to a reasonable pricing structure. Just in a sense like list, uh, list um, in, a in, a, in a supermarket or a clothing store, they have you know 44 shorts, 42 shorts, and so on. It's not your exact size, but it makes it easier for you to find your suit, your suit size. This idea of, of price coordination as a way of reducing transaction costs, search costs, is that something you dealt with when you dealt with any trust? I've never dealt with it, yeah. but, but it's obviously a, a valid uh, piece of investigation. Uh, the, the difficulty in so many of these questions you're raising is that the work hasn't been done. The work hasn't been done. Well, that's a question. Why hasn't? I mean, there are vastly more economists now than when you were a young man. There are many more, and arguably, people to answer and address these questions. Why has the economics profession found these questions so worthy of neglect? It's because they don't study the economic system. They study other economists' writings. Mm -hmm. And the economic literature consists of a discussion of discussions of discussions, <laughs> of discussions, and so it can go on. Yeah. And it, it's not really dealing with uh, what happens in the real world, it's, it's uh, dealing with this imaginary world that, that is economics. And what put it on this, I mean, in a way, one thinks that academics are interested in improving human welfare, and improving human welfare, arguably, requires dealing with the real problems faced by humans. What, what, what caused this? I mean, at one time, of course, uh, Adam Smith, certainly, your own work, and, and there are a handful of economists throughout history who have dealt very deeply with the real problems faced in the real world. Why, haven't, why hasn't that been the dominant trend, or why isn't that the dominant trend? Well, economics has, has become a theory-driven subject. It, what is in the textbook is a theory and people are not interested really in empirical work. A lot of people have to do empirical work in order to get a PhD, uh -huh. but once they've done it, they move over to mainstream economics, which is a theory, theoretical uh, s subject. You've only got to look at the, the journals. Uh, well, you, you can't even find any English there. It's all <laughs> symbols. Uh, uh. Yeah. I, when I was a young man, I was uh, looking at one of the... I had a, a computer printout of an analysis I was doing. And, of course, computers allow you to keep all the numbers you wish, all the decimal point numbers. So I had a number with about, oh, ten, ten pieces after the decimal point. And, of course, the data I was using was maybe accurate to one significant figure. And an older analyst looked over my shoulder and said, son, I don't know about that last decimal point, but the first one's wrong. <laughs> yes. That in a sense we were so enamored with the technique that we failed to understand the input we had was so inaccurate, we should be looking for much cruder, uh, simplistic answers to that question. Yes, economists are trained in techniques mm -hmm. of analysis, not in, in, in the finding the real problems, which you could find if you went into the street. Mm -hmm. They don't go into the street. What are the criticisms that's been levied against the Chicago School generally, and even people like yourself, and, um, and Telser to some extent, are, is the Austrian critiques. The, the, in some ways, the Austrians believe everything is unknowable and so on. And they claim that in some ways, the law and economics movement has substituted an all-knowing judge 
for an all-knowing central planner uh, that in effect we've not we still have uh, this this top-down thinking that picks the right answers from the wrong answers it one time was the all-knowing economist at his blackboard and law and economics shifted it to the all-knowing judge who can always calibrate the least cost avoider and all the other issues how do you I mean I, I've got my own opinions on that, but how do you comment on that? Have you heard that criticism? I, I, I haven't heard it, but I understand it. Well, there isn't any perfect system. Right. And uh, one in which the, uh, the judges have to decide is one in which they have to decide what property rights should, should exist. Well, they have to decide what property rights should exist, and we do our best those of us who work in law and economics, to, to get them to, to look at it in the right way. Well, they, they, some will and some won't. Uh, but human society is, is such that people will commonly choose the wrong way. Uh, Gibbon said, human history is a history of human folly. And it's true. And I guess the arguments that Hayek particularly, but others make, is that the best we can do is to create an institutional framework that allows experimentation and a system that encourages successful experiments to flourish. And we'll have mistakes, but hopefully in a, in a system that is free enough to allow successful experiments to be replicated, the civilization will advance by gradually evolving institution. It's not planning so much. It's, it's a, we, we obviously use our reason, but our reason alone gives us an idea, but it's experience and evolution that proves, validates those experiments. Well, of course, Hayek is right. Yeah. Uh, and, and this part of Hayek I like very much. Yeah. Uh, the use of diffuse knowledge, yes, yes. which is what he talks about. That's a powerful idea. But to a large extent, your work and others, all of you are imbued with that view of institutions and the way institutions gradually evolve to allow, in your term, transaction costs to be lowered, or I doesn't use quite that language, but essentially to allow new opportunities, new exchange opportunities to emerge. That process is, in a sense, what we might call civilization, is always experimental, subject to mistake, and there's always the lust of the intellectual to get it right, to plan change, to l litigate change. Um, there, is there a tension between your view, the view of Hayek, and the view of the, I mean, what is the tension between the central planner view and the view that you hold? Well, the central planner gets the right answer. Mm -hmm. Well, you only find the right answer as a result of people making a lot of errors. Uh, errors, uh, people want to get rid of the errors. Well, the errors are very useful. They tell us where not to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore where to go. Yeah, I, it's, it's what I think, well, Aaron, I don't know if you ever met Aaron Wodowski. No. But he was one of my great heroes too. Aaron Wodowski says, the greatest risk of all is, is to live a world that seeks to avoid our risk. Because yes. prudent risk taking is the only way you explore the future. Uh, oh yes, and some of it isn't prudent, and yeah. that's most valuable. <laughs> that's most dangerous. Yeah. Yes. People try different things. Uh, the the idea that you should try and eliminate all these failures is quite wrong, because it's the failures that tell us where the successes are. But both Hayek and I think to some extent yours, your work. Obviously, rational man has to use his reasoning power to make suggestions as to how a policy should be changed. And yet, rational man has to be aware how often intellectual guidance has failed to point us in the right direction. So in a sense, we're condemned to use our rationality while being somewhat humble about it at the same time. It's, how does one capture, in, in your own work, how do you balance those two tensions? Uh, well, I don't have to balance them. Fortunately, human beings are not rational. Yeah. And therefore, they do things which 
if you were rational, you wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. Most new businesses fail. Right. Well, if you're rational, you say to yourself, if I start a new thing, it's probably going to fail. I shouldn't do it. <laughs> so we wouldn't have any new businesses. So the but, the, but the new businesses may in usually fail, but it's the ones that succeed that, that uh, yeah. uh, tell us the way to go. George Soros uh, was commenting on the, uh, the, the anniversary of Kitty Hawk and in his way. He said, if I were there, I would have shot down the plane because in the next generations, vast amounts of money are lost in airline companies that go bankrupt. And I thought, yes, true. On the other hand, the world is vastly better because this new technology came That's in. That's right. And it was, in a way, what is Schumpeter's term? Animal spirits? The animal spirits drive us into the future. That's Keynes. And that's Keynes, is it Keynes, yes. yes. Well, it's one of Keynes' better lines than I ever said this. Yes, he was very good at lines. <laughs> uh, yeah. okay. Well, let's see, is there anything on the, the, the general course of economics? Do you think it's beginning to become again aware of its political and empirical roots, or is it still drifting towards the, the blackboard model? Well, you have to distinguish between mainstream economics, which is, is uh, rightly a, a dismal subject, uh, from work that is done, yeah, as it were, on the outskirts, in development economics, you're getting interesting information, in, in interesting uh, work done in law and economics. In fact, it's, what is interesting is to see where the interesting work is being done. It's not being done by and large in economics departments, it's been done in business schools, mm -hmm. in law schools, mm -hmm. in engineering schools. It feels closer to the reality, the real world in this sense. Yes, <laughs> and one's less subject to the uh, control uh, of, of mainstream economics. Hmm. The, the journals, after all, people say it's, you shouldn't have peer re review. <coughs> the difficulty with peer review is that the peers have the mainstream viewpoints and therefore will not be receptive to uh, other views. I have been uh, concerned with the development of what is called the new institutional economics. Right. This, this deals with real world situations and in order to deal with them you have to take into account the laws that exist, the attitudes that exist, the, the, the uh, the sort of sociological aspects, all of which affect how people will, will respond. Uh, I mean, if you, if you think that the uh, best thing to do in life is to sit as a hermit in a cave, you're not going to get very much economic development. Yeah. And the rest of us who are not in the cave will suffer. Yes. Yeah. It's, a, it's a feel that is... Uh I think you're right. We're saying, I know the think tank community is asking lots of questions, both on the left and the right. Um, the um, engineering, law schools, development department. The World Bank actually is asking some very thoughtful questions. So for, after years and years of being locked into an orthodox model, but years of failure have finally persuaded some of them that maybe what they've been doing was stupid. Um, yes, there is a, a degree of acceptability. Yeah to the views of the new institutional economics mm -hmm. with which I have been as associated. Who is, the, who is the current chair of that? I think it's Claude Menard of the University of Paris, of but I'm not sure about yeah. that. And we should, uh, that's one of the encouraging traits. And um, any other little thoughts about uh, what you hope the economists about? <laughs> when we're talking to your successors 80 years from now, what kind of, uh, 90 years from now, what kind of world would you like to see? What kind of hopes would you have for the policies of America and the world? Well, what I'd like to see is to people to study how the actual economic system operates. Mm -hmm. They don't really study the economic system at all, which sounds uh, ridiculous, but in fact what they do is they study problems. Mm -hmm. 
this problem, that problem. Well, the economic system is like the human body. It has a lot of different parts, all interrelated, and what we have to study is how the economic system actually operates. We, ha we don't do that. Maybe in the 80 years you talk about, economists will do that. And I hope some of the people at your conference will do it. <laughs> well, we'll do our best. We really appreciate your talking to us. And thank you very much for letting us interview you and have our exchange for you. I've, um, as you know, I'm, I'm a great admirer of your work. I've read all of your materials and find applications to the real world in all of them. And in and ways of wording them that are I've, I've borrowed shamelessly your terminologies to say things, and I find uh, you're a tremendous communicator. So it may not have had as much effect as you'd like in the economic field. What is it? A prophet is without honor in their own country. But it certainly seems to me that your thoughts have gone much much further than most economists, and are not just in the arid world of of academic econ economics have gone into parts of the world that where there are real opportunities to do more. So. Well, I hope they'll go further. Yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much, yes.